Okay. Ah, look at this microphone. It's so it's so highly functional. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Bill, for that those kind words and the wonderful introduction. I think I might have to put remarkable journalist on my business card. <laughs> um, so. Um, as Bill mentioned, I'm Rebecca Robinson. This is Steve Strom, photographer and grandfather extraordinaire. Um, together, we uh, spent the past, um, gosh, at this point, over four years um, working on um, two books. Um, the one we're going to read from today is called Voices from Bears Ears, Seeking Common Ground on Sacred Land. And uh, we also have a photography book, um, Bears Ears, Views from a Sacred Land, that really is a showcase for Steve's remarkable photography. Um, and those are, uh, those are sort of the, the fruits of our labor over um, a number of years to try and tell the human story behind the Bears Ears debate. Um, so what we want to share with you today is uh, the story of how Bears Ears National Monument came to be, um, the complex and often contentious history that informs the debate over public lands in the Bears Ears region and San Juan County, Utah in particular, um, missed opportunities to find common ground on these issues. And um, finally, uh, Steve will present some examples where common ground, people were able to reach common ground on public lands issues and sort of illuminate why those efforts succeeded where Bears Ears failed. I'm sure they don't really need any introduction, but those are the Bears Ears. Um, 8,500 foot tall uh, twin butte, buttes um, that rise above the landscape in San Juan County, Utah. They can be seen from 60 miles in all directions, and they figure prominently in the creation and migration stories of Native peoples who trace their ancestry to the region, some of whom still live on those lands. So we'll set the stage with a brief excerpt from the book. The best way to comprehend Bears Ears country is to take wing. With the benefit of a bird's eye view, the scale and rhythm of a landscape spanning 3,000 square miles comes into full relief. Endless spires, buttes, mesas, and canyons sculpted and painted by water and wind. Streams and rivers through whose veins and arteries the desert's lifeblood and scarcest resource flows. The vast terrain bears scars as well of explosive emergence and tectonic shifts that sculpted the earth into otherworldly formations of stark cinder cones, petrified sand dunes, and impossibly steep ridges, all painted with a wild palette of colors. It is country that both tests the body and stirs the soul. In a landscape that often looks and feels empty, one is constantly reminded that humans made a life and a living here long before our time. Enter any of the canyons in this expansive region, each one, like a sandstone fingerprint, completely unique, and you will find evidence of ancient civilizations that thrived in a harsh climate, building stone structures and crafting pottery and tools and weapons, remnants of which have survived for centuries, even millennia. The canyons bear silent witness to the earliest settlers of this land, the native peoples whose descendants trace their creation and migration stories to the Bears Ears region, some of whom still live on their ancestral lands. Weathered wooden fence posts and old cattle corrals dot the many miles of open range in San Juan County, evidence of the area's first Anglo settlers, Mormon pioneers who in 1879 made a pilgrimage through rugged and punishing terrain to establish the San Juan mission in Bluff, Utah. So this is an artistic depiction too, actually, of um, the trek uh, Mormon pioneers made on what is called the Hole in the Rock Trail uh, that uh, traverses southern Utah from southwest to southeast. Um, and then uh, this is a photo taken uh, from the Hole in the Rock Trail in 2016. Beautiful landscape, uh, not necessarily um, optimal for navigating in covered wagons. Um, so the Mormon, the descendants of the Mormon pioneers take, uh, there's a map of the landscape. Uh, the Mormon pioneers take great pride in um, the fact that they were able to make this journey, um, believe they were called by God to um, establish a mission in Southeast Utah, the first mission in that part of the region. So Bill uh, did us the great favor of summarizing um, the next five minutes of our talk. 
um, the, in, in December, on December 28th, 2016, um, Barack Obama, what's that? I'm just gonna move this forward so you're not bopping Okay, it. okay, good, am I bopping it? Okay. Yeah, you're good. I'm good? You don't okay. have to do that, but. Okay, got it. Normally I do a handheld. Um, so Bears Ears National Monument established December 28th, 2016, um, established via use of the Antiquities Act, executive order, um, this is the 1.35 million acre monument as established um, in, by the proclamation in December 2016. Um, the map we'll show you next um, is quite different. Um, this is the Bears Ears National Monument reduced by 85% uh, to just over 200,000 acres. Um, and they're non-contiguous units, which is significant as well. Um, the, uh, both the tribes, uh, as well as archeologists, um, paleontologists, conservationists, very much see the Bears Ears region as a continuous cultural and ecological landscape. And so by reducing this to not only just a, a fraction of its size, but also placing it in two non-contiguous units, that um, very much uh, was seen as a slap in the face and a misunderstanding of um, the significance of um, this cultural uh, and ecological landscape. Um, and so why was it reduced? Well, there uh, are several reasons, um, one of which is um, extensive lobbying by uh, extractive industries, oil and gas and mining. Uh, the Washington Post in early 2018 did some really crackerjack reporting on this. Um, and as well, um, the Utah congressional delegation um, did some pretty hard lobbying of the president as well, led by um, Senator Orrin Hatch. Um, and a lot of that was in response to um, their conservative base in Utah, who uh, some of whom uh, live in San Juan County and were very much opposed to uh, the establishment of the National Monument, seeing it as a land grab by the federal government. Um, and so we find ourselves in a very litigious situation. Uh, Bill outlined um, the uh, different parties to the lawsuit as well as the status of the lawsuit. One thing I will add is this week, um, a U.S. District Court judge who had been, you know, lobbied by the Trump administration to dismiss the lawsuits against um, Bear, the reduction of Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments um, agreed that the cases could move ahead. And so that's a very significant development um, in this story. Um, so that it, and that is one blow against the Trump administration's efforts to um, make these reductions permanent. Um, so briefly, I have given you the introduction to our book, so um, I don't need to reiterate. Um, but we, over the course of several years, interviewed more than 70 people for this book, some of them many, many times. Um, and we were able to speak to very candidly with a number of different individuals, some of whom you might recognize. Um, they're tribal leaders, um, congressional representatives, uh, conservationists, members of the um, uh, OHV community, ranchers, um, and descendants of Mormon pioneers. Um, some of you may recognize members of the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition, Josh Ewing of Friends of Cedar Mesa, really kind of a whole cast of characters. Um, all of whom were deeply involved in the efforts to um, either protect Bears Ears or uh, lobby against its designation as a national monument. Um, and so we want to share with you um, a few of the voices of the people we spoke to about why they felt such a strong connection to this place and how it should be stewarded now and into the future. Uh, so we'll begin by looking at native uh, cultural and spiritual connections to Bears Ears. Um, and we'll read this quote from the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition. We are a spiritual people. However, our holy practices happen right here on earth, not in a church, but in special places like Bears Ears. We sometimes talk to the plants, others sing to the mountains, and we seek our ancestors who still roam this land. And we ask them for guidance in the language they can understand. In times long past, the ancient ones sanctified this land and its special places, and the blessings remain in force today. 
Native people see their origin and migration stories manifest in the land, its sculptural forms, and its flora and fauna. The canyons and gulches of Cedar Mesa, the buttes of Valley of the Gods, and the backbone of Comb Ridge figure prominently in the creation stories of Native American tribes and pueblos in the Southwest. Evidence of Native people's forebears abounds in abandoned adobe structures built into the sides of seemingly unreachable sheer cliffs. Celestial events, animals, and human-like figures depicted in petroglyphs carved into rock and pictographs painted on protected sandstone walls. A rich trove of baskets, pottery, and jewelry, and the buried remains of those who came before. In San Juan County alone, as many of you know, estimates place the number of ancestral Pueblo and Ute and Navajo sites at well over 100,000. So we spoke with a number of native residents of San Juan County who were engaged in these efforts to protect their sacred lands. One of them is Joni Yellowman. He's a traditional spiritual leader and healer. Um, and he was a founding member of Utah Dene Bikea, which was the grassroots native-led nonprofit um, that really began the um, organized efforts to protect the Bears Ears region back in 2010. Um, and so we spoke with him about his connection to the land and what he thought about uh, why it was so important to protect it. I was told that, you know, you don't say this is my land, this is mine. You don't say that. It's very, it's not the, good, the right way to say it. This is everybody's land, you know. This is all of us, you know, we, we're all God's children. And so Jonah very much felt, um, as many Native people do, that, that this idea of land ownership is antithetical to um, what it means to live on and, and be part of and one with this landscape. Um, and he spent a lot of time talking with us about um, you know, mining operations that have stripped mountains and mesas for their mineral wealth and severed relationships with the past. And he and others were devoting so much time and energy as part of Utah Dene Bikea and later um, the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition to ensure that these places that were um, and are so sacred and also uh, essential to um, physical sustenance as well were protected um, going forward for um, today's and future generations. Um, and also he talked about the obstacles they faced, um, systemic racism, people underestimating uh, him and, um, and other Native people, telling them, you don't know how to do this, uh, any manner of racism and condescension. And so that was an added impetus to try and prove people wrong and say, you know what, we are, we have developed a very uh, sophisticated way of documenting our cultural resources and we know we have what it takes to petition a presidential administration for the permanent protection of those lands. Um, and he said, I think it's going to open a lot of minds um, what we're able to do as um, Native people when we organize in this way. Um, one thing we weren't aware of when we started our work um, was the depth of the Anglo-Mormon cultural and spiritual connection to this land. Um, they believe, as I said before, they're called by their Heavenly Father, um, their God, to endure this arduous journey across the state to establish a mission. Um, their descendants have called the area home since 1880. Um, there's another shot of the hole in the rock trail. Um, one, of the, one of the things we were allowed to take part in was an annual pilgrimage um, down the hole in the rock trail um, in ATVs. And uh, it is, uh, even, even uh, in vehicles like that, it is not for the faint of heart. Um, and they uh, take great pride in having mined and ranched and uh, farmed a really arid uh, and forbidding land. Um, and they truly do believe that this part of Utah is their promised land. And um, I mean, just taking a look at these landscapes, beautifully rendered by Steve, I might add, um, it's easy to get a sense of um, why people do feel such a strong spiritual connection to it. This is actually right outside Bluff, Utah. Um, or technically, I suppose it is uh, in Bluff, Utah. Um, but we were puzzled as we began our research by the disparity between um, the sort of reverence for the land that um, we heard expressed by, um, by members of the LDS Church, as well as uh, things that are enshrined and stated in the Book of Mormon, 
and uh, a lot of s statements we heard about, um, you know, their anti-environmentalism and, you know, it's, there's it's a sort of cognitive dissonance and we, you know, said we have some thoughts about why that might be, but why don't we talk to an expert? So we called up uh, George Handley, who's a professor of theology at um, Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, um, and he specifically studies uh, the connection between environmentalism and Mormon theology. And so what he told us is stewardship is a very strong principle in Mormon theology. The teachings speak to preserving resources, keeping them healthy, as well as the idea of being mindful of future generations, not taking more than you need and making sure you're respectful of creation. However, stewardship in recent generations has lost more of its environmental implications. The term stewardship is implied to mean development. God gave us resources on this planet for a reason. They're intended to be used. The idea of preserving something in perpetuity doesn't make sense, especially when the territory has something that we need. So we found that to be illuminating, especially from a scholar who's a member of the LDS Church. Um, and we spoke to a number of uh, descendants of those Hole in the Rock pioneers. Um, and Kay and Patsy Shumway, they're, uh, I think, sixth generation descendants. Um, the Shumways, it's a very prominent family uh, in southern Utah. You know, when you travel in that area and you start to connect with people who um, are Mormon, you have the Lymans and the Reds and the Shumways. And we'll hear from a Red and a Lyman in just a second. But, um, but, um, Kay uh, is quite a skilled photographer, and he talked to us about how uh, his love of the landscape uh, connects to his faith. But I hope somewhere in the story that you use the word sacred. These places are sacred to me. I go to these places to, to pray, to take photographs, to look at the stars, to look at the beautiful landscape. In the same, you know, it's just as sacred to me as it would be to an Navajo elder. So I hope that part of the story gets told. So uh, Kay Shumway, uh, in you know, talented photographer. What? Okay. 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 Um, pay no attention to the screen in front of you. <laughs> Um, uh, so Kay Shumway, very, very devout, very mild-mannered, uh, very skilled photographer. The Abajo Mountains are uh, particularly uh, sacred to him, and it's a place where he um, photographs, and a uh, lifelong resident of San Juan County, he used to wander these places freely. Um, and so in recent years, when the Bureau of Land Management has closed off roads to protect sensitive cultural resources and or um, ecological landscapes, he and others in the county have sort of seen this as, as an affront and sort of a, you know, imposition on the freedom they've had for generations to, um, to appreciate this, these landscapes in their own way. And so... You know, he was telling us it got to be the point where we would grumble among ourselves, what can we possibly do to show these federal agencies how the local people feel when they're shut out of these places they've always loved for generations? Um, my caveat after sharing that quote is that local, the definition of local people there is, is very narrowly defined, and you find that quite a bit in San Juan County, but there, you know, you hear a lot of the locals want, and they're, I think, is not always an expansive, uh, inclusive definition of, of what, you know, who locals are. Um, and what do we have? Ah, yes. Um, so I, here's another caveat. This will be the most whirlwind um, history uh, you will ever hear in a presentation. So one of the things that is central to understanding the public lands conflict in uh, the Bears Ears debate is the rich and painful history of this region that goes far beyond um, designations on a map. Um, as you know, as many of us know, um, the history of Native peoples in this um, country is is fraught with with. Uh, pain and struggle and oppression and um, the tribes of the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition have plenty of that as well. Um, this is a map of um, the long walk of the Navajo in the early 1860s. U.S. Marshals led by Kit Carson 
um, rounded up um, Navajo and marched them hundreds of miles from their ancestral lands to what amounted to a concentration camp um, hundreds of miles south. And people died along the way. People died while there. And they were there for about three years before um, they were allowed to return. Um, like many, um, almost all, um, tribal people across the U.S. at a particular point in, in history, um, there was a forced removal of Native children from their homes and uh, their placement in um, government-run boarding schools where quite often they were forced to renounce their um, Native language and uh, cut their hair and, and uh, there would be punishment for uh, any sort of expression of Native culture. Um, something that's very current and relevant in San Juan County is um, gerrymandered political districts. Um, for a very long time, um, there are three commission districts in San Juan County, and for a very long time, um, there, uh, uh, the native population, which is the majority of the population in San Juan County, only had one uh, representative on the three member county commission. Um, and then in 2016, I believe, um, a US federal judge said, you know what, this is uh, clear racial gerrymandering. You have to redraw your boundaries. Um, they redrew those boundaries. And in November 2018, for the first time in history, um, two uh, native commissioners were elected to the county commission. And um, that has been all sorts of fun in the county. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we may talk about that later. Um, environmental justice issues loom large. Um, San Juan County is home to the last operating uranium processing mill in the country. And so um, there, you know, everything from contamination of water um, to other things are very much a concern, especially for the Ute Mountain Ute people who live um, adjacent to that um, processing mill. So all of this is sort of what uh, Native people bring to uh, the Bears Ears issue. There's a lot of pain, there's a lot of struggle, there's a lot of racism and um, the stakes in public lands issues are really high. Um, someone who really, who's played a central role both in Diné Bikea, he helped co-found it, and in uh, Utah politics uh, writ large is Mark Maryboy. Um, he lives in San Juan County. He was the first uh, Native County Commissioner in San Juan County and I think the first Native elected official in the state of Utah in 1986. Um, he, you know, he was the first political representative who was able to speak out for um, issues that affected Native people. And, um, and when he retired in 2010, he was really ready to just kind of live a peaceful life free of racial strife and, um, and politics. Um, but then um, things, history took a different turn. Um, but first we'll hear a little bit from Mark about his introduction to politics. In 1968, um, President uh, Bobby Kennedy came, mm -hmm. and he met with the elders right there where the trees are. Wow. He was running for the president. And <clears throat> that's when, I guess you might say, I was introduced to uh, politics. I was just a young kid running around all over the place, climbing around on those trees. And then my, uh, all of a sudden my dad went back to school. So I'm, all of those old people, they're going to be gone pretty soon. Listen to them, listen to what they have to say. So I sat down for a moment and watched those old people talk. And I noticed that they were talking about the land here, across, all the way into the Abajos, Bears Ears, Moab, Monticello, Salt Lake, Green River. And they told Bobby Kennedy, those are very important. And the land is who we are. It's something that sustained us for millions of years. So from a very early age, Mark Maryboy understood the importance of uh, protecting land um, and gaining that knowledge from elders of um, what needed to be protected. And so uh, in 2010, he 
came out of a very short retirement <laughs> to, uh, to co-found Utah Diné Bikea. Um, and the group spent uh, the next few years documenting, talking to elders, gathering some of that, um, that cultural knowledge um, and literally plotting on a map, um, though of course not with specific sensitive locations identified, but basically plotting on a map. These are the places that are culturally sensitive to our people. These are sacred sites. This is where we gather medicinal plants and herbs, where woods gathered. Um, and they were, made the case to the government for protection, but what they realized was um, they were a grassroots nonprofit group. They weren't necessarily in the best position to advocate to the federal government for protection of the lands. But uh, the tribes have a unique power as sovereign nations to speak directly to the federal government. And so what Mark Maryboy and others realized is uh, in order to make the most powerful case that we can for protection of these landscapes, we need to bring more tribes on board, more sovereign tribal nations. And so um, Mark Maryboy and others from UDB, um, to shorten it, uh, spent time going to uh, different tribes and pueblos across the Bears Ears region saying, look, we all have this shared heritage in common. And um, if we want to protect it, our best shot is to come together as a coalition um, and advocate for that protection. Um, and so in July 2015, the Bearsers Intertribal Coalition had its first meeting, participation from the Navajo, the Ute Mountain Ute, the Hopi and Zuni Pueblos, um, and the Ute Indian tribe in northern Utah. All of these tribes um, trace their ancestry to the Bears Ears region. And uh, the implications for an intertribal coalition coming together is really profound. For the first time, a group of Native American tribes would, could um, work hand in hand with the federal government in determining how um, those uh, public lands are managed. Um, so it was kind of a watershed moment in 2015. Um, and we know what happened next. <laughs> but um, there's another side to this, of course. Um, and uh, you know, the part of the Mormon history uh, involves uh, pain and persecution as well. Um, they, you know, went from their, uh, their initial homeland in New York um, to their promised land in Salt Lake. And um, it was a painful journey. Their prophet was murdered along the way. They, you know, faced um, a lot of persecution from folks who were afraid of this new homegrown religion. They also were uh, sought after by federal marshals who wanted to enforce laws against polygamy. Um, so there's very much uh, remains in um, the Anglo-Mormon community, at least the folks that we talked to, this very strong sense of persecution by the federal government. Um, and something that really comes to bear on the public lands issues is that as a condition of statehood, um, the federal government said that 70% of Utah land um, had to be public lands managed by the federal government. And, you know, here's your public lands maps and, um, you know, you see lots of red in the West and, um, and Utah has a, a large percentage of public lands. And if you look in Southeast Utah, San Juan County, in fact, has over 90% of its land, the land within its borders is public land. So there's very much still a sense of imposition by the federal government um, of uh, these laws about how people can use the land they consider theirs and that they consider to be deeply sacred. Um, and there's also a movement that's very, uh, very popular in the Tea Party area um, to transfer ownership of federal land to the states. Um, this idea of sovereignty that states can better manage the land within their sovereign borders. Um, it's, there's also a take back the land rhetoric that is factually suspect, but very powerful um, in, in rural communities, particularly in the rural West. Um, so uh, Phil Lyman might be a familiar name to some of you. Um, he's a one-time San, San Juan County Commissioner, current Utah State Representative, um, and a staunch uh, opponent of Bears Ears National Monument, very much seeing it as an example of federal overreach. Um, and he, um, you know, he has deep ancestral ties to the region. His great grandfather was one of the original Mormon pioneers. Um, the more time you spend in this area, the more time you hear my great, 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 great grandfather came over on the Hole in the Rock Trail. Um, and so we heard that from a lot of people, including Phil. He's most infamous for, in 2014, leading an ATV protest ride 
through Recapture Canyon, uh, which is um, known not just as a popular uh, ATV trail, but also as um, a place with a number of culturally sensitive Native American sites. And so, you know, by, uh, by taking and leading this ride, um, not only did he uh, put a call out on social media to people from across the country, including some Bundys who showed up, um, and, but he also um, deeply offended Native people in the area because it sent a very clear message that um, you know your recreation, um, you know your recreation is more important than our cultural heritage, and so this was a big flashpoint as well. Um, and, but Phil very much feels oppressed by the federal government too. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that in 2009, um, FBI agents raided um, a number of houses in Blanding, which is where Phil lives. It's the biggest um, town in San Juan County. Um, arrested 16 people. The memories in that, uh, of people who live in Blanding were uh, people are deeply traumatized by it. We hear stories of, you know, FBI people coming through in flak jackets, taking people out of their houses, slamming them up against the wall. And there's a deep sense of persecution that a lot of people in Blanding feel. And, you know, what Phil told us, well, and, you know, on the other side of it, there are Native people, archaeologists, um, conservationists who say, well, wait a second, you know, if you uh, grave rob and if you loot, there should be consequences. Um, and so, you know, there's, so that's another way in which uh, the, the anti-government sentiment bubbles up here is it's very personal for a lot of people. And yet, um, when we asked Phil in 2016, like, what's, what's the worst thing that would happen if a monument is established? You're very opposed I, I to said, it. I said, it's what's okay. the worst thing that would happen for you individually if this was designated? And he said, you know, they have a whole bunch of land. And he said, honestly, for us, our land would probably go up in value. Probably. And I said, I'm thinking the same thing. For me, if I was selfish, I don't, I'm don't. I'm an accountant. I don't do books for ExxonMobil and Denison Mines. I, I do books for hotel owners and restaurant owners and guides and people that are tied into the tourism thing. So I look at this whole thing. If we want a local economy, you don't get that by big oil coming in, it's great because they pay a lot of money to the county and help to pay for the school, which is, I don't, don't diminish that at all. But just, you know, going out and being able to open up a business and do something. And that's like, I said, I, as much as I don't want it to happen, you have to say, if it does, we'll, we'll maybe be better off. So, you know, Phil Lyman, uh, monument opponent, um, you know, hitting on something really important that, you know, extractive industries have pro provided a lot to this region, but, you know, maybe that's not the future of the county. As much as, you know, some people may feel a deep attachment to those industries, maybe there's something else that, you know, could provide a more prosperous future. And so Heidi Red talks about that too. She's a longtime owner of um, a ranch in Indian Creek. Um, so if you're, you know, familiar with, with that area, you know how stunning it is. Um, you also know that um, it's near, it's outside the Needles District of Canyonlands National Park, which, uh, you know, has seen an explosion in um, tourism. She's also right across from um, the Indian Creek rock climbing site, which also has increased in popularity. So she's an interesting case in that she's been in San Juan County for about 50 years. She's seen the boom and bust from mining. Um, and so she knows that it's you know helped build the schools and the hospitals, um, but she knows it's not gonna be the forever solution. At the same time, she's seen what, what she calls industrial tourism has done to the region and so she was very concerned about um, what would happen if Bears Ears was designated a national monument. Um, and yeah, and so what she told us is that, you know, tourist dollars come at a high price. Uh, it's very demanding on the land. You drive your car down here, you use gasoline, you stay in a motel, you use water. This is, you know, the land where her ranch is, so. Just, just for perspective, this is where she lives. Um, 
And she said, once you decide it's a park or monument, you then advertise worldwide. Come on in, the door is wide open. Uh, part of the beauty here has always been that you could walk out and say to yourself, you know, I might be the first person to ever have seen this, but we're losing that. And the more activity you promote, the more you lose. Um, and so how do you keep it so that everybody in the United States, every person that wants to, doesn't come to these areas? And, you know, she said compromise. It's, we can't all have exactly what we want. We have to find a balance in um, how we use um, and recreate on these lands. Um, and finally, we have, uh, we spoke with Regina Lopez Whitescock, who's a member of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. When we spoke with her, she was the co-chair of the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition. And she talked about the formation of this uh, coalition and how um, it was the first time she recognized the power of different tribes coming together, despite their sometimes painful histories, um, to achieve a common goal. And for her, it went far beyond uh, just protecting land around bear's ears. Um, you know, she said that if we put ourselves out there, we could really be advocates for a lot of people to help them to organize or elevate their voices. And she also spoke really profoundly to what she saw as her role as a member of the coalition. You know, one of the things that I communicated to the legislatures was I'm, I'm a spokesperson, not only for myself and my people, but for those that aren't able to speak for themselves, and that's the land, the water, the air, and the animals. They're not able to speak for themselves or advocate, and that's who I speak for as well. So one of the things that Steve is investigating is what is compromise regarding public lands use possible? And if so, where has it worked? Um, and so I will turn it over to Steve for a brief exploration of, um, you know, we know what went wrong in Bears Ears, but what went right other places and what could provide a template for future public lands agreements. So this gives you kind of a visceral feeling for the, um, for the level of passion on either side of the Bears Ears debate. The, these are signs held outside uh, a, a meeting place in uh, Bluff, Utah, where Secret then Secretary of the Interior Sally Jewell met with over a thousand folks from San Juan, largely from San Juan uh, County, to listen uh, prior to making a decision about the, the fate of Bears Ears. So you can see people strongly opposed to the declaration of the monument and strongly supportive. On the top are, are Sally Jewell, along with representatives from the Bureau of Land Ma Management, U.S. Forest Service, Fish and Wild Wildlife. Uh, there's a picture of the meeting in Bluff, uh, and it turns out that uh, there were tremendous efforts inside the Obama administration to seek a compromise solution and, in fact, to work with the legislate, uh, legislators from um, from Utah and uh, seeing whether instead of declaring a uh, national monument, they could come up with a legislative solution which would have protected some areas as wilderness and some areas as a national conservation area. But alas, uh, those uh, conversations came to naught and um, compromise was unfortunately not uh, able to be reached. So can there be compromise? So what I've been doing uh, in the context of a book about the San Rafael Swell is putting together the material that uh, would comprise what you might call case studies of three recent public lands compromises. One, to protect Boulder White Clouds Wilderness in Idaho. Two, to protect some areas ar around St. George, Utah in, and uh, Zion National Park in Washington County, Utah. And finally, in Emory County, Utah, where the San Rafael Swell Recreation Area was declared. So there's a picture of uh, Idaho, shows you where Boulder White Clouds is. Here's a photograph of one of the wilderness uh, uh, areas protected. Um, it, here are Emory and Washington County. So Emory County is just to the uh, northwest of San Juan County, and Washington County is in the, in the lower left-hand side, the southwest corner of, of Utah. So there are the two national conservation areas. Red Cliffs National Conservation Area and Beaver Dam. There's a, a couple of photographs of the areas that are uh, were protected. Over 200,000 acres were protected uh, in Washington County. And there were some wilderness declared uh, as well. Those are outlined uh, in, 
I guess, vivid chartreuse any, <laughs> in, in any event. Uh, and here are the areas in Emory County that have been protected. Uh, the light green area is the San Rafael Swell Recreation Area, uh, and the brown areas are a Desolation Canyon, Labyrinth Canyon, and Muddy Creek uh, wilderness uh, areas. So nearly a million acres were protected in one fashion or another from in the Emory County Public Land Management Act, which was passed uh, in March of this year, remarkably enough. So. Um, there are some pictures of the, San, Ra of the uh, uh, San Rafael Swell Recreation Area. Next. More pictures of San Rafael Swell, replete with, uh, with uh, large numbers of native artifacts. Next. Based on those three case studies, what are key elements of successful compromise? Recognition of knowledge, wisdom, value, and culture of communities adjacent to public lands and, and recognition of folks' strong connection to and traditional uses of those lands. So that's what happened, uh, happened in all of those three cases. In San Juan County, however, there was enormous distrust between Anglo and Native uh, populations. There's a long history of what I hate to use the term racism because it's thrown around rather loosely uh, in today's political uh, discussions, but nevertheless, I, I, I don't think any other term applies. Uh, and perceived conflict between traditional uses and, and conservation, and traditional uses mean ranching and mining. Discussions involving multi-stakeholder groups is, are crucial to reaching compromise. Those groups have to involve local folks, groups outside the area, including conservation groups, federal and state agencies, and tribal interests as well. It's important to note that each of those three compromises, Boulder, White Clouds, Emory County, and Washington County, required between 15 and 25 years each. Mm -hmm. So the road to compromise is long and winding. It takes time to build trust. Okay. The PLI process, the Public Lands Initiative process, which was the process led by Representative Rob Bishop, uh, uh, attempted to reach those compromises in seven counties. Unfortunately, they gave themselves only two and a half years to do so, not nearly enough time to, to, to really reach uh, a mutual understanding uh, and, and uh, the trust needed to effect compromise. Outside groups were excluded. In particular, uh, I'll just name one case where outside groups were excluded, and that is the tribes outside of Utah, the very tribes Zuni and other Pueblos in New Mexico, Hopi, who traced their ancestral roots to the, the Bears Ears region were excluded deliberately and uh, explicitly from the discussions. A very important point, strong leadership by the county, by county commissioners and congressional representatives committed to seeking compromise is really needed. And that was true in Emory County and true in Boulder White, uh, White Clouds. Uh, unfortunately, discussions, this is probably the understatement of the presentation, <laughs> discussions in San Juan County failed to establish trust with the tribes. And unfortunately, the congressional representatives, then Representative Rob Bush Bishop and Jason Chaffetz before he was replaced by John Curtis, uh, there was not the kind of leadership that would have uh, led to, um, to compromise. Commitment to win-win solutions and avoidance of maximalist positions. Unfortunately, there were conservation groups who wanted nothing uh, short of passage of the America, America's Red Rock Wilderness Act on the one hand, and on the other hand, OHV people who wanted every road and cow path uh, kept open to mechanized recreation, just to name two extremes. It's essential to see landscape through both, uh, both your eyes and those of others. And uh, one of the phrases that was used by uh, Representative Mike Simpson and his staff, as Chief of Staff, Lindsey Slater, they're the folks who worked for 20 years, 20 years, to bring about the Boulder White Clouds Compromise. Uh, they said that uh, the world is very lonely in the center uh, in, in these days. And yet they felt it was their mission to find what they called the radical center. Well, the San Juan County Public Lands Commission was managed, uh, did in fact uh, manage to find compromise. There was a group of nine stakeholders 
pretty broad, broad, broadly representative who met, met for two and a half years as part of the Public Lands Initiative, came to, to, to compromise. Unfortunately, uh, when, uh, when their proposals were kicked up to the commissioners and later to Congressman Bishop, uh, well, in any event, what, what came out was nothing approaching what they had suggested, so that was rather unfortunate. Uh, I suppose the, 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 the glass half full statement would be they came darn close to compromise. And I think that, that uh, if you talk to folks on the environmental side and on the protectionist, on, on, the, on, the, on the local side, uh, you'll uh, actually uh, find folks who believe the compromise with the right leadership could have been uh, reached. This is a crucial statement as well. You know, fo folks parachuting in from Washington or trying to control a process in Washington, either directly or through their lobbyists, that's not going to work. It's best to be in the landscape, talking with people literally out in the landscape, and that takes time, willingness to, to talk over a campfire, and so on. And I would argue that the compressed time scale of the PLI process just precluded anything much outside of discussions and meeting rooms around maps, and that's just not a successful way of proceeding. And I think this is the final one. Uh, involvement by environmental organizations proactively seeking partnerships with and establishing trust with communities adjacent to public lands. Some environmental organizations, in fact, did engage in the PLI process, but not all. Others withdrew their support uh, when, after the, uh, the uh, uh, Recapture Canyon ride that Re Rebecca alluded to, and again, the pre compressed time scale of the PLI made it really difficult to establish mutual trust. But the message for most of you sitting here is uh, that it really would behoove the conservation community to heed the example of folks like the Few Charitable Trust and the, the Wilderness Society, who did in fact sit down. The Wilderness Society met with the Public Lands Council in Emory County, Utah for 10 years. Uh, uh, and, you know, they listened to and became sensitive to the needs of that county uh, as well as the need uh, and crucial need to protect um, uh, the public lands, uh, uh, San Rafael Swell and the wilderness areas to which I alluded uh, earlier. So uh, I, I think it's important to, to, um, to not take maximalist position and to um, take into account the needs of uh, of rural counties adjacent to public lands, many of whom are suffering economically. And it's true that they would like to continue extractive industries or ranching and so on, some, some things that may be inimical to, uh, to conservation. But um, it, um, it uh, turns out that, you know, if you're gonna advocate for conservation, it might be wise to think about how your advocacy affects the economic future of, of folks in, uh, in those areas. And so sit down, try to understand their problems, and see if you can work with them to find mutually acceptable solutions. And I think that is the end, other than to um, point you to uh, our website, bearsearscountry.com, where we try to keep up with, with the ever-expanding activities taking place around Bears Ears, including the fate of the, of the, litiga of the ongoing litigation, but also uh, some of the, some of the uh, mineral leasing that the BLM is carrying out thanks to the um, energetic um, adv advocacy of the Trump administration for an America first energy policy and so on. All of that's there uh, as law. And, and Rebecca, you can say something about the remarkable somethings that are on the website. <laughs> Oh, those remarkable somethings. Yes. yes. Um, oh, those. <laughs> um, so one of the most compelling things on the website, I think, are um, the 360-degree interactive panoramas um, of Steve's photographs that um, he uh, has he spent many hours uh, in the Four Corners region taking photographs with his drone. So you get really neat uh, aerial footage uh, that, you know, thanks to the magic of technology, you can um, you can kind of do a 360 degree navigation of the area, and it's a whole new way of um, experiencing the Bears Ears landscape. So um, I encourage you to check it out. Um, thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate being here.
the question was how do state governments fit uh, fit in? Um, leadership from uh, from the state is important in a couple of ways. One, uh, uh, the state uh, has uh, the resources. In case in the case of Utah, uh, agencies set up to uh, work with um, uh, with um, the counties to plan for a more diverse economic future. Uh, from what I've been led to understand in the interviews that I've had so far with regard to the San Rafael Swell, uh, thus far they haven't um, uh, concentrated as many resources as folks in really isolated rural co uh, communities would like. Second comment I'll make about Utah is that Governor Herbert of Utah um, has tilted at various times in the direction of uh, supporting uh, compro uh, compromise. In fact, one of, I guess his chief of staff at the time, in any event, one of his staffers uh, at the time was present at the bluff, uh, at the bluff meeting uh, and um, tried to direct the, uh, the discussion along the lines of compromise. And there was such, there was such um, vociferous feedback from the governor's base that um, uh, he um, walked back the comments of his of, of his staff member, but uh, in in conversations with that particular staff member, and these are off the record, but uh, that particular staff member, it, it, there was certainly a, an inclination on the part of the governor uh, to do that. But it's it's interesting. It's it's analogous to as I as I was led to. Uh, understand, and uh, it, it, it's a situation in Utah is very much analogous to, to what it was uh, in uh, Congress when John Boehner was uh, Speaker of the House, where 20% of his caucus is, was essentially um, uh, had a stranglehold on, on the policy uh, of um, uh, on policy issues. So it's rather unfortunate. I think, you know, from what I can tell, my sense is that the governor's office would be more inclined toward compromise and, and effective leadership, but, but uh, the complexities of, of the Republican um, nominating caucus is such that it makes it really difficult. I think we do. If it's not on our website, it's in our book. And if it's not on our website, we should put it up right away, because <laughs> we have one. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a there, I believe there is, but Rebecca's right. It should go up up there. So you, there's probably a follow up to the question of where I think the I, can may I rephrase it to 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 ask, you know, where are the energy resources uh, right. relative to, and I can answer that qualitatively, but not with a map. Uh, the answer. Uh, why don't you? Okay. It, tur it, it turns out that, that the boundaries of the Obama uh, Bears Ears um, uh, designation were drawn in such a way as to uh, exclude an area uh, in the western part of the of Bears Ears region. I can go back to the, yeah, yeah, yeah you're trying. Anyway, there's, there's a, a little gap uh, in the outline of, of Bears Ears. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Oh. We have the I, technology, I, yeah. and I know how to use it. <laughs> anyway, that uh, the the white gap over uh, over here around Great Canyon mm -hmm. uh, is an area that was excluded uh, as part of the Obama administration's effort to take into account the uh, uh, the requests of the Utah uh, uh, delegation. That's an area that's rich with uranium and had been a a, a big. Uh, an area where a considerable amount of, of, of uranium and vanadium uh, mining had taken place. In terms of other resources, this area here, and into the Navajo reservation down here, uh, is in fact, is in fact, yes, you'll get me that, is in fact an area where which is rich in oil. There's an area, um, uh, on the Navajo Reservation, uh, I don't know. Not, anyway, just east of the Bears Ears, uh, there's there are extensive oil and gas uh, 
resources, and those areas were excluded from the monument. We, to we talked, one of the sources with whom we talked was uh, Vice President of the Oil and Gas uh, Association, and we asked him directly uh, whether uh, there was significant oil and gas within the proposed boundaries of Bears Ears, and the answer is no. Okay, um, first, the first efforts to protect the San Rafael Swell and, and surrounding regions were made in the late 1990s, one. Two, um, there were some key, the, the, the Emory County operates in, a, in, in an interesting way. They not only have a, a three-person county commission, but they also have in parallel something called, they, they call a public lands commission. And that public lands commission uh, it, uh, meets once every month with representatives of the state to, to um, uh, one, the BLM, uh, the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife, as well as a huge range of stakeholders ranging from ATV groups to conservation people to ranchers, minor, mining interests, and so on. So they meet religiously once a month, which means that they're talking to, to each other. And there were three sets of propose, proposals prior to, to, to the one that finally was passed as part of the Dingle Conservation, Recreation, and Management Act in bar March of this year. Um, but you asked uh, what were the interests that had to be compromised. I alluded to the America Red Rock Wilderness Act uh, which has been advocated by the Southern Utah uh, Wilderness Alliance um, since the late 1990s. Uh, and it pro um, proposes uh, designating as wilderness a couple of million acres in, uh, in, in Utah. And it's been put, it's been, in, the, the, the bill has been introduced in every Congress since, since the late 90s. Um, uh, I, I want to say two good things about SUA. They pre prevented a lot of bad things from happening in Utah, but they also believe that the most important uh, sort of protection that you can get, and it's true if you can get it, is wilderness, because, you know, wilderness means that it's, it's, it's the strongest form of, of protection, better than a national park, better than a national monument. It keeps things as close to, to its current state as you possibly can. They advocate strongly for wilderness, and and they um, they uh, move the Overton window to the left. Uh, I think that's a fair way of putting it. On the other extreme, probably the most difficult people to to, to deal with are the uh, mechanized recreation folks, uh, and. Uh, and it, it, they're they're not they're not monolithic any more than SUA is you know representative of every conservation organization. Um, there are many interests, but basically, you know they they believe that if you uh, if you close any road in on any public land, somehow that's going to lead to to the closure of every road in every public land. And when I was talking to a representative of the o OH. Uh, sorry, a Washington-based representative of the OHB community, and uh, we agreed that the the best analog to this is the is is the NRA um, uh, taking the position that any um, gun safety regu regulations means that that tomorrow morning your guns will all be taken by the federal government, but it's that kind of extremism, and we and uh, it got to the point, and I'll make this one of the sources for Emory County. Um, who came out in favor of this compromise, had his businesses um, uh, boycotted and his family harassed uh, by the OHV community. Uh, I mean, the guy was, uh, was in tears on the telephone conversation I had with him simply. I mean, it's a small county. You know, the, most of the families are, are LDS. They're, they go, they're, they, their roots go back generations. And so it's not just you know, some random neighbor interaction. It's interaction of extended families who have been there for a long time. And so these, these you know, the, the positions are held, you know, they're, they're highly emotional. And, you know, the other emotion is that, you know, is, is that 
this Emory County is a coal county, and they depend upon coal for their uh, livelihood and and so on. And they're very fearful of the of the war on coal, and and so that's another issue that complicated thing and require required uh, a lot of leadership to convince people that the land that was being um, uh, cons uh, being conserved did not affect their economic future. We want to thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. And uh, thank Bill and Linda for uh, inviting us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.